Well, a very good morning to everyone. My name is Nicholas Reed from Reed Corporate, and on behalf of Critical Resources, ASX ticker CRR, I'd like to welcome you to this special investor webinar. Thank you very much for joining us at relatively short notice, following what is obviously a very significant milestone for the company this morning with the release of a maiden mineral resource estimate for Critical's flagship Mavis Lake lithium project in Ontario, Canada. I'll shortly hand over to Critical's Managing Director, Alex Cheeseman, who joins us from Perth this morning. Rather than a conventional presentation page turn, Alex is going to quickly walk us through this morning's announcement, which is available as a handout on the webinar platform and displayed on the screen, and briefly overview its significance for investors and shareholders, as well as the outlook for this exciting project. But we're mostly going to use this morning as, a, as an opportunity to take your questions. Alex is very happy to answer questions about the resource and where the company's headed. So if I could encourage all of those listening in to please use the webinar Q&A function. The questions will populate right in front of me and we'll put them to Alex. Um, so without uh, further ado, Alex, uh, congratulations on this announcement this morning. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks for making your, yourself available. And uh, if you could just begin by giving us a quick run through of uh, what this resource means for the company. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Um, and I mean, obviously, it goes without saying it's a significant milestone for the company, um, a, a huge achievement that we're really proud of. And, you know, that's that's everyone, the, the ops team, the management team and the board, um, something we've been working towards for, for some time. Um, and really, you know, the it, the maiden resource is exactly that. It's our first line in the sand where we've really um, defined uh, what we've done over the last sort of 11 months um, at Mavis Lake, which has been a continuous drilling program uh, to come out with 8 million tonnes at 1.07% uh, lithium oxide. Um, it's, it's fantastic. You know, it's really where we want it to be right now in testament to the work that's been done. Um, it, in terms of looking forward, uh, like I said, it's a line in the sand, it's a maiden resource, and we will grow from here. Um, importantly, though, what it really does is, you know, it moves us away from lithium explorers. Uh, we move into development. Uh, and also, from a point of view of defining a resource, we join a very small group of companies that have actually defined a, a hard rock lithium resource. Uh, we're one of only two companies in Ontario now that has a jaw compliant resource, uh, and that's fantastic. Fantastic, Alex. Um, well, look, uh, welcome anyone to, to start firing your questions in, but I've got a couple lined up here that uh, were sent in previously. Can you give us a bit of context about the significance of what it means to define a resource, particularly in the lithium space, right at this at this moment? Yeah, absolutely, Nick. So, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, by having the resource out, by going through that process and actually, you know, defining and delineating um, the mineral resource estimate, um, we can quantify what the project value is. You know, we're able to sit here now and objectively value, you know, the, the Mavis Lake asset. Um, it's not an exploration story where you're releasing sort of, you know, assays every now and then and, and you know, trying to build suspense of what you might have. We now set a very firm, clear line of what we do have uh, and then gives us a position to build on from there. Um, you know, not just being a lithium explorer and mixed in that group. I think off last count, we saw a report saying there, there's over 400 lithium projects in Canada. Um, we now join a very exclusive group that's actually defined a resource. Um, and the importance around jaw compliance is quite important from investors as well, because uh, as an ASX listed company, uh, we are bound by the JORC code. So, uh, you know, ASX listed companies have to define under JORC. Um, there are TSX and AIM listed companies that will define under 43101. So, uh, you know, but if you're looking from a, an Australian retail investor perspective, JORC compliance is key. Thanks, Alex. You've done this pretty quickly. I mean, 11 months to first resource is, is, is pretty fast. Um, and I, I might just go into a question that's just popped up here from, from John. So why is there no indicated portion of the resource? Um, in answering that, can you just give us a, a bit of a sense? I mean, you have achieved this, you know, in a very short space of time, how much drilling went into it? And perhaps if you can talk to the next steps for the resource itself. Yeah, yeah, good question. So, look, the key reason why um, it's all inferred is that the resource geologist, um, AMC consultants out of West Perth, um, weren't able to conduct a site visit. Uh, so that's one of the key things in terms of drill spacing uh, and um, drill spacing for invert, inferred category um, uh, and indicated. That's 
there's a mix of drilling completed at the main zone. Um, so what we expect as we continue to build and drill out the resource over the rest of this year uh, is when we do a resource upgrade, um, you know, probably scheduled for the first half of 2024, uh, we will uh, split that into indicated and inferred um, because we'll plan a site visit probably the back end of this year with the resource geologists um, and also get them on to have a look at Gullwing and Tot Lake where we haven't drilled yet, but we probably expect that we will have drilled by the end of this year as well. So in terms of drilling strategy over the next, say, six to 12 months, um, where is the resource, where is the upside in the resource specifically and where, and if you can talk in a bit more detail, detail about some of those um, regional prospects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we made it pretty clear in the announcement that we've only drill tested sort of 2% of the Mavis Lake project area. Uh, I referenced before Gullwing and Tot Lake. Uh, that was the strategic acquisition we made late last year. You know, we, we knew we had something. We wanted to expand our footprint. Um, so the Gullwing, Tot Lake prospects, uh, we acquired those and, and then staked the ground in between Mavis Lake and Gullwing, Tot Lake. We really simply refer to Mavis Lake project area now is that is that single contiguous block. Um, we haven't done any any uh, field work on Gullwing and Tot Lake yet. The, the snow was in. Um, as that's melting uh, right now, we have a, a spring field work program planned and we'll have the geologists out um, mapping and rock chip sampling over Gullwing and Tot Lakes, six kilometres of, uh, of strike. We're, we've, we know that there's lithium mineralisation in spodumene. Uh, to, and they'll be generating, you know, really high confidence drilling targets that we would expect to drill at the second half of this year. If we go back to Mavis Lake. Uh, as the announcement says, uh, the main zone is open uh, laterally and at depth, so there's obviously continued growth available there. Uh, and we've also still got a number of mapped spodumene bearing pegmatites that haven't been drill tested, you know, immediately adjacent to the Mavis Lake main zone. So, you know, we're we're blessed with so many good quality drilling targets to go and hit. Uh, it's just a case of continuing the drill rig spinning and and moving through that over the course of this year. Thanks, Alex. I, I've got a perhaps a slightly tongue-in-cheek question here, when will CRO overtake PLS? But I guess uh, <laughs> we were just chatting offline earlier. I, you know, we, were, we we both remember when PLS put its first resource, its first lithium resource out, I think it was 2014, and as my recollection is that was around 8.6 million tonnes. Is Can you maybe just talk to the scale of the, the pegmatite system that you've defined at Mavis Lake and... I mean, is there, you know, what is the, the longer term potential here? Uh, look, in terms of scale, I think, you know, one of the questions we put to the resource geologist was, um, you know, can we define and, and delineate an exploration target? Um, uh, unfortunately, from, from one sense, because of all the success we've had in the main zone and we hadn't drill tested all these other areas, he, he wasn't really able to include all these really highly prospective areas um, to build out that target. So I think it's something that will probably evolve over time this year. You know, once we get on the ground um, in the next couple of weeks, um, potentially run a small drill program up at Gullwing Top Lake to test. You know, we've, you really don't know what's happening until you get the drill rig spinning and see what's there. So... Um, I mean, ultimately, you know, we've got those key things of um, plenty of prospective ground, plenty of map pegmatites um, that, are, that are with lithium contained in spodumene. You know, that that is a key a key uh, differentiator, um, and we're just raring to go. And I think, you know, if we have a look at the the rate of which we've drilled and the effort that we've put into the program since we started in April last year, you know, thirty two thousand metres, uh, sort of straight up, it's a it's a pretty ag aggressive and and robust drilling program, um, and that's what we want to continue going forward. So, um, whether we bring more rigs in or not is, is something we need to manage. We've actually found. Uh, a single rig running 24-7 is really the optimum sort of uh, rate of effort um, and an efficient way for us to run our programs. Uh, we did bring a second rig in at the beginning of this year just to try and get as much into the resource as we could in a short amount of time. Um, but the feedback from the drillers and the, and the geologists is that that single rig 24-7 um, steady state, we get really efficient um, use of cash and, and drill metres. You know, we, um, we're, we're sort of just over a dollar per tonne per ton of resource for exploration spend at the moment. It's, um, you know, very, very cost efficient program. So, you know, spending our money wisely is something we want to continue to do, obviously. Thanks, Alex. Next question here from Bob. It's a three part one. Number one, when do you expect the next resource upgrade? 
Number two, when do you expect the inferred to move to indicated? And number three, when can we expect offtakes? And are you are you in a position to say which countries these offtakers will be based? So it's probably a four part question, actually. <laughs> I suppose I remember them. Good part is um, I suppose those first two points. You know, when we we'll do a resource upgrade. Um, I expect in the first half of 2024, we'll give ourselves another, you know, nine months of drilling and data. These are um, fairly time consuming and, and, and not, you know, not cheap exercises to go through. There's a lot of input involved in actually pulling together resources, a very rigorous and robust process. So we want to make sure that we uh, the upgrade comes in with sufficient data to make sure it's a meaningful increase. Um, as I mentioned, between now and then, we will get the site visit completed with the resource geologist. Um, we'll make sure that anything that comes out of um, you know their reporting at the moment uh, in terms of being able to increase from um, into uh, indicated um, is is you know what we what we really work towards over the, the rest of the year so when that resource comes out um, you know it'll have that classic split of indicated and inferred um, I, I couldn't comment at the moment of the portion of, of, of either in terms of the second you know half of the question around offtake We've been talking to potential groups uh, around offtake for some time. Um, one of one of the benefits, I suppose, from my previous role in uh, the lithium industry in terms of selling spodumene, I'm, I'm fairly well connected to you know a vast of um, you know converters and and battery manufacturers and, uh, and and interested parties that are they're in the lithium supply chain. So a lot of the conversation has always been around well what have you got and you know what does offtake look like um we are obviously well aware that offtake at the moment is a very strategic thing that we are in a structurally um a structural deficit in terms of supply for lithium and, and i believe that that will be the case well into the next decade so we're not in a rush to to sign up offtake um, we are using it um you know as a means of you know for commercial leverage in order to you know ensure that any offtake partner we get is a is a quality partner and is able to help us with what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do is continue to grow the resource and and you know move the project forward you know eventually into production thanks alex so i've got a few questions here that are sort of going to the the development and mining kind of issue so tell us firstly a bit more about the Mavis Lake location, What, how conducive is it to mining? Uh, you've worked in the Pilbara for many years. I mean, perhaps, you know, how does it compare for, from an Australian investor's perspective? How, how do we think about the location? There's a lot more trees at Mavis Lake than there are in the Pilbara. That's <laughs> One point of difference. Look, I think, you know, and, and we've mentioned this multiple times and, and I sort of, you know, alluded to it before in terms of our exploration cost per tonne of resource. Um, Mavis Lake as a project is um, is singularly different from every other Canadian project um, that, that we're aware of at the moment. Um, being so close to the town of Dryden, you know, Dryden is 10,000 people. Uh, it's got primary, secondary schools, hospitals. There's uh, industrial support in terms of maintenance, logistics. Um, and we draw on Dryden right now during this phase of the company's life. So our geologists, you know, are in a long-term Airbnb lease. They they go to the shopping centre, buy their groceries and cook their meals. You know, we're not paying for remote logistics. We don't have uh, a remote camp that we're sending diesel to every month. You know, we don't have to helicopter in drill rigs. Um, it, it, these things sound a bit sort of far-fetched, but that's what's happening to some of these projects in Canada. Um, and that adds a significant amount of indirect cost to exploration that, that we simply don't um, have to worry about. Uh, it allows us to put all of our money, you know, the vast majority of it into, into actual drilling and technical supervision and management of the program. So we expect that that, um, that benefit of Dryden to, will follow straight through uh, into both CapEx and OpEx savers as, as we look at, you know, the inputs and the financial model around uh, a future operation. We don't have to build a camp. We don't have to build roads. We don't have to build communication networks. Um, we don't have to build power generation. There, there are hydroelectric power transmission lines that surround the property at the moment, and there is a, a structured pathway for us to be able to access that. And we've, we've already started those conversations now. So um, in terms of, I suppose, 
holistically as a mining jurisdiction, uh, Northwest Ontario, you know, they say to us, we're, we're proud mining people. They're very supportive of the mining industry. Um, I, I would sort of note that my observations are that the, the type of mining is slightly different. You know, you're not talking about bulk kind of iron ore is, and that sort of huge scale that we see and, and, and think about in Western Australia. Um, but uh, nickel, copper, gold, um, sort of smaller um, you know, smaller operations, very common um, throughout Canada. So the other interesting thing in northwest Ontario, the primary industry at the moment is forestry. Uh, there is a paper mill at, uh, at Dryden and forestry is an industry that is in decline. Um, obviously, you know, people moving away from, from paper and books. So it's part of the government's push to try and look at um, you know, other industries and, and obviously critical minerals is something that Canadian government is, is really getting right behind. Um, so, you know, from a government perspective, very well regulated. Um, they're keen to see progress. Um, you know, from our point of view, that's great. Um, we just make sure that we balance that, obviously, with our communities and First Nations engagement um, uh, and, you know, continue to do things well and diligently um, and move the project forward. That's that's what we're here to do now. Fantastic. So uh, very different to the Pilbara, but, but still a very much an investment grade destination by the sounds of it. Um, you know, I would say, yeah, you know, Canada, Canada, very much a low risk investment environment, um, you know, well established industry um, yeah, and, and very supportive of mining. Great. I'm going to jump through a few more webcast questions here. So Brian Tan says, do you have an estimate as to what lithium price, what the price of lithium would have to be in order for the project to be pro profitable? So I suppose uh, sort of rephrasing that, well, you know, where would it need to be for you to be confident of a, a strong, robust project? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a great question. Um, we've we sort of mentioned to the market a few times that we're undertaking um, sort of, you know, inputs and scoping level studies and technical studies at the moment, ultimately to build a, uh, you know, a CapEx and OpEx model to understand what the project valuation looks like. Uh, we, we don't, you know, to be honest, we don't have that data yet. It, it's incomplete. It's a work in progress. So um, I, I couldn't say where we sit on the cost curve. Um, as I mentioned, I think from a uh, from a capex perspective, there are a lot of things that we won't need to uh, spend money on to to uh, build out a, a mine and processing plant, and, and that's really around non-processing infrastructure. Um, some of the projects, you know, even in Ontario, need to look at four to five hundred kilometres of road to then access the nearest road. Um, you know, that's a significant investment um, just to be able to get the product out and away to market. We don't have that. Um, you know, we, we're literally one kilometre off the Trans-Canada Highway, which runs straight to the deep water port at Thunder Bay. So I expect that from a CapEx perspective, we will be, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be pretty pretty lean there, which will be good. Uh, from an OPEX perspective, again, without having that remote nature of the operation, we'll get some huge savers there. Um, you know, we, potentially we, we won't even, you know, we won't need a camp. We might just get a long-term lease at one of the motels or, you know, we could we could buy one ourselves probably. But it's, um, I think we'll be positioned, you know, re you know, relatively well on the cost curve. In terms of long-term pricing, look, that's, um, that's a, a fantastic question. And, you know, we can wax lyrical about that for days if anyone wanted to. But, you um, there's a lot of a lot of sort of market analysts and, and price reporting agencies that are putting out their long term forecasts. Um, you know, sort of 25, 27 US dollars a ton uh, for an SC six basis is is sort of what most people are, are leaning towards. Um, it's quite interesting. That's obviously a lot lower than where we are right now. Um, I think it's probably conservative because you know, as I said before. We are the industry is is in a structural supply deficit, um, and if we look at the industry's response to that supply deficit, uh, which led to obviously an astronomical price rise, um, we haven't seen a lot of extra tons come online. You know, there's been a, a restart of some idle operations. Um, we've just seen core lithium come online. That's really the new, the only new entrant to bring extra tons back into the market. Everything else that has increased over the last two years has been a case of, you know, restarting idle idle operations. So then you go back to, well, who's next? Um, obviously, Liontown is de is in project delivery at the moment. Um, Sigma is is sort of commissioning. Um, there's not really many others that are ready to go. Um, if we then sort of, you know, look at our jurisdiction, um, 
like I said, there's only two ASX listed companies with joint resources in Ontario. Um, you know, ourselves and Green Tech, um, both in kind of you know early stage development at the moment. Um, what's the timeline for production? You know, um, it, it's it's a couple of years away. So um, yeah, that that ability for the market to instantly react and, and sort of turn on tons. Uh, it just isn't there, um, and and it needs a high pricing environment to incentivise continued exploration, continued access to capital to develop the project. So, you know, conservatively, we're you know twenty five, twenty seven hundred dollars a ton. I, I think we're going to see sustained pricing much higher than that for some time. And what that means is for us is you know right here, right now, if we're in production, we'd be a very high margin business, and you know that's uh, that's the exciting part. Makes a nice segue into our next question. It's a follow-up here from Bob. He says, with so much M&A occurring in the lithium sector at the moment, do you see critical as a small player being swallowed up by a bigger fish in the future? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, anyone who knows my history knows I fell on the wrong side of M&A activity um, in the last cycle. So um, we'll leave that behind us. But look, um, small player... Uh, you know, I, like I said, we've joined a very, we, you know, we've joined a very small group of companies that actually have a resource. So I don't think we are a small player anymore. You know, we're instantly, um, you know, one of two in Ontario that have defined a, a joint combined resource. And if I look back, if I'm correct, I think we're only one of three ASX listed companies that have defined a maiden hard rock lithium resource in the last three years. You know, th there's there's plenty of lithium exploration companies out there. There's not many that have actually, uh, you know, defined and delineated a resource uh, and then continuing to push that forward and talking about um, development and production. So um, you never know what's around the corner, um, but I think our focus at the moment is uh, continue really to, you know, um, focus on the on the project and advancing the project. Um, you know, we've got uh, very supportive shareholders, um, you know, very tight top 30. Um, so any M&A activity that, you know, was ever put to us, um, it would only be something that would probably be a result that's going to deliver a great result for shareholders. You know, that's, that's, that's one thing's for certain. Sure. I've got a follow up here from John. Will you provide further information from the MRE, such as a block model, pitch shell, and grade tonnage curve. Yeah, look, it's um, there's there's a fair bit of detail that sits behind the MRE, um, or it sits behind the announcement. Um, some of that information is obviously particularly sensitive, um, and I expect a lot of it will probably come out. Um, you know, when we're talking about our technical studies and you know, um, the release of scoping studies or you know, um, PFS or BFS. So um, we'll we'll balance um, disclosure of the market with what is what is very sensitive um, versus you know what what needs to be disclosed. Thanks, Alex. Um, I've got a, quite a long question here from Rob. I'll just sort of quickly summarise it. There's a couple of parts to it. Uh, he says, can you can you say whether you think the resource could potentially hit 50 million tonnes by mid next year? Uh, that's putting you on the spot, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> and, he's, and he's also, it's just a question regarding funding and your 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 sort of funding position. And I guess the, the, the question is, have you had any interest from uh, potential funding partners instead of, you know, coming back to the market for, for equity? Yeah, so um, <laughs> first part of the question, 50 million tonnes by the middle of next year. Um, 15, 15, sorry. 15, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. I was going to say 50 million. 15, look, you know, it, it's pure speculation, so I probably can't say, uh, but I think that that would be something that we, would, you know, to double the resource uh, in another 12 months is something that we would we will be aiming for. Uh, to go higher than that, obviously, um, you know, in the years to come, uh, that's what we're working towards. Um you know, we're not. We've always said that we're going to adopt a, uh, a sort of a dual strategy going forward. So, technical studies and development studies, but continue to grow the resource. You know, we've we've spoken a couple of times about Pilgrim Minerals. That was that was a real lesson learned from myself. You know, watching their rise. Um, you know, they define their resource and then they continue to grow year on year on year uh, and get it as large as they could. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, what was the second part of the question again? Sorry, Nick. Uh, it was. Interest from funding partners. Interest, um, yeah. So, uh, it, look, it ties a little bit to the um, to the offtake discussion as we mentioned before. You know, um, there's plenty of interested parties. 
um, we've had we've had some offers that you know some significant funding put to us, but uh, they came with hooks and caveats uh, that as a board we weren't comfortable with, um, and, and we also didn't think represent a fair value for shareholders. So you know, making sure that we get uh, the right deal uh, that sets us up for success and is also a good outcome for you know for for current shareholders and future shareholders is, is really important to us. So. Um, you know, it's not a case of just sort of taking the, the quick, um, the, the quick sort of uh, free hit of money. Um, you know, as a board, we uh, and with our corporate advisors, we we, we sort of strategize over these things. You know, daily, it's a, it's a constant effort to make sure we're trying to do the right thing uh, and grow the company. Um, what we what we can do, and I think what we've proven at the moment is uh, we're very very uh, fiscally. Um, conservative you know we get excellent value for money for the dollar spent uh so any money that, that we do raise is put to work uh, and delivers results fantastic yeah and i think to use your pilbara analogy the uh they used equity you know pretty effectively to grow quickly in the early days so um so it certainly worked for them mm. um in uh here's another question that this is a bit of a tricky one in your opinion do you think we are undervalued compared to Lion Town's Baldania resource, which is 15 million tonnes at approximately 1% this uh, year. So, I mean, I think the interesting thing there is how how do you value the Baldania asset um, as, you know, as part of the total value for, um, for Lion Town? You know, I think... You know, Baldania as an asset itself is probably undervalued. You know, Lime Town's carrying value is most likely on Kathleen Valley. So, um, how how you would look at that, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of us, um, I would say that we represent excellent value um, and a great opportunity to um, to you know, and an entry price at the moment to get in on a company that um, does what it says it's going to do, delivers. Um, it delivers results and, and has huge growth potential ahead of it. Um, that's probably how I'd answer that one. Thanks very much, Alex. A couple more web, webinar questions here uh, from Nick Patel. What is the target resource size to justify mining? Uh, also, he says, is it a concern that lithium grade is low and may require high grade lithium to support production of SE6? Um, can you just sort of address address the those couple of issues um yep so i think that that second question is probably a really good one um and you know uh, the benefit here is i can i can sort of draw on some real world experience and um an operating experience of, of lithium operation so you know you go back to the altura plant uh, or the altura operation their resources uh, if i'm correct was that uh at at 0.99 percent lithium oxide um and with that as a global grade um, under the financing mandate, they had to feed the plant for the first two years of operation at a head grade of 1.2% lithium oxide. So 1.07% um, as a global grade, you know, in, in my mind is not low. Um, you know, we, um, it's, it's anything over 1% allows you obviously with the, uh, the peaks and troughs of what you see in terms of grade throughout the, uh, throughout the resource uh, to, you know, manage feed uh, efficiently and effectively to, uh, to produce your concentrate. In terms of concentrate production from our MET test work that we completed, you know, we've seen that we have created, um, you know, a, a very high grade, low impurity product. Um, and I think that the, the, um, you know, the interesting thing, though, is SC6 is probably a bit of a misnomer now. Um, we're seeing, you know, the current producers are really, you know, winding the grade back uh, and, and going for recovery uh, and tonnage. So, you know, the discussions that we've been had with uh, with our process engineers at the moment is we would probably look at a steady state production of 5.5, 5.6. Um, you know, we know that you can, you know, you can throttle it up. Uh, in terms of grade um, and end up getting, you know, a high grade concentrate. But, you know, with the market being so starved of supply, um, that's not really required. You know, it's a fascinating time in terms of pricing. You know, DSO at the moment is getting higher prices than, you know, lithium, you know, SC6.2 you know, was getting uh, back in sort of, you know, uh, 2019, 2020. So, um, yeah, look, I think the... I'm definitely not, you know, I think the grade is is, is solid um, and we'll be able to make a very good clean concentrate from that uh, and we'll have that control ourselves in terms of uh, grade and tonnage and recovery. Um, the first part of the question, sorry, Nick. Um, 
what size of resource would would trigger a you know i guess moving into well studies and development studies you know mining considerations so, I mean, we see that 8 million tonnes is an absolute trigger to move into development studies. Uh, we already started before we had the resource out. Um, you know, that probably testament to our style and our approach to, you know, keep things moving as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, what's viable for an operation, I think, you know, anything over probably, you know, in this market, in this location, anything over 10 million tonnes, you know, if you can get a 10 year plus mine life, um, and that's definitely, you know, I mean, we're, we're just a whisker away from that now, um, noting that we've already got extra uh, results and drilling information to feed into a resource upgrade already. Probably haven't spoken to that one yet, but, you know, we drew a cutoff line at the end of March for our drilling. Um, we've continued drilling since, so we've got data to go into an upgrade already. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be over 10 million tonnes, um, definitely, you know, very clear clear of 10 million tonnes by the time we do our resource upgrade. Um, and probably, you know, really 15 million tonnes plus, I think would probably, you know, you'll see globally would be the trigger for a, for a nice small high margin business. It's going to give you 10 to 12 years sort of life of mine and, you know, contribute a meaningful amount of concentrate into a North American supply chain. Thanks, Alex. We've just got a couple more, which I'll try and rip through quickly because I know you've got an AGM to get to. Uh, um, from Ben, in the long term, would you see yourself and the team at Critical uh, as taking the Mavis Lake through to production rather than a takeover? I'm sure no, knowing your you want to yeah. be running a mine, don't you? <laughs> well, this is, you know, um, absolutely. Having done it before, um, we're here to do it again. We're starting to pull together um, a, a team of people, you know, they've been helping us along the way, sort of quietly in the background, but you know, um, being able to leverage the experiences of, of the Pilbara Minerals, at, you know, and, and the Altura sort of journey and, you know, uh, things that both companies did well, things that both companies could have done better and apply that to Mavis Lake, um, 100%, that's what we're doing. Right. Uh, another one here from John. When is milestone one payment being made to the sellers of Mavis Lake since you're now greater than five million tonnes? That's a good question. Um, the answer to that is uh, commercial incompetence. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to, there's a couple of sort of broader questions here, which would probably be quite good to, to finish with. One is, um, there's been a lot of talk about Canada as being a lithium hotspot, given its proximity to North American, uh, the EV market, the gigafactories, etc., and the government's focus on supporting a local critical minerals supply. But are there actually any lithium mines coming online at the moment to meet that demand? Yeah, look, um, uh, an interesting question. And, and, and I think I go back to the point I said before, you know, what we're seeing, I mean, in Canada at the moment, you, you're seeing the restart of Namaska uh, and also the restart of North American lithium. So um, not new projects, just a restart of, of, of idle projects. Uh, in terms of new mining projects, um, nothing has come online yet. Um, and again, I can sort of go back to this point of, you know, the significance of defining the resource for us, it means you know, but taking that step out of exploration and looking for something and now having defined a resource that is, you know, we believe even at the moment will be, you know, will represent as a very commercially viable project. Um, you know, you join a very small group, but um, there's a lot of people still sort of wandering around staking ground, you know, chip sampling and hoping that they've got something. So, um, you know, and as the question sort of alluded to, the significant, you know, trillion dollar investments by the downstream industry to build out um, electric vehicle manufacturing capacity, battery manufacturing, battery capacity um, in in the US and Canada, um, unprecedented investment. So it's a it's a really exciting time for us to, to be part of that. Um, and I think that's the point that we really are. We are going to be part of that um, that North American supply chain. It's um, um, I mean, I, obviously, there's also an opportunity for us with a deep water port to to feed into a European supply chain as well. Um, you know, the cost to ship product from Thunder Bay to Corpus Christi, where Tesla's building their plant at the moment, um, is, is you know within five dollars a ton to send it to sort of Teesside in the UK uh, or into deep water ports in Europe. So, um, you know, Canada is in a fantastic location. 
Um, and I think that's, you know, apart from the exploration success that a lot of companies are having, um, the, the physical location of Canada and its its access to sort of North American and European markets and, you know, even the traditional sort of um, North Asia markets, it's, it's, a, it's a great position to be in. Um, you know, I, I would put Canada and, and Western Australia as, you, you know, your two premier hard rock lithium districts globally. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. I'm just going to combine these last two questions here. Um, what is the, so you've talked about a dual development strategy. Uh, what exactly does that mean? And, and I suppose the second part of that, just give us a quick overview of what the next six months looks like for critical. Yeah, so, so dual development strategy, um, again, uh, you know, continuing down our technical studies, so our environmental monitoring and MET test work, you know, we completed our, our sort of scoping study MET test work. Uh, we'll move into a much more comprehensive, um, you know, sort of DFS sort of uh, level of studies. Uh, all the engineering works that underpins, you know, um, a, a PFS and DFS, we, we've got to start working through all that stuff. Um, and, and the work's already begun. The, um, the other part is obviously the continued sort of exploration or, or, you know, as we can refer to now, continued resource growth. So uh, we'll do both of those in parallel, you know, studies and resource growth over the next few years. Um, in terms of the next six months, what does that look like? Um, probably more of the same. So, you know, the drilling program continues. Um, we are about to, as I said, do some springtime um, field work, you know, trying to generate some more high confidence targets at Goldwing, Top Lake. Uh, study side continues. We're going to have people out uh, conducting the springtime surveying and monitoring of flora and fauna. Uh, really important things for us to get underway in order to support, you know, eventual permitting and, um, and you know, the claims to lease process and bringing the project, you know, going through all the regulatory steps we need to in order to get the uh, the project permitted and, and as we said and into operation so um no rest uh we'll we'll in we'll in agm uh, fly out to london a bu bunch of uh meetings at the one-to-one -one conference next week come back um probably go and talk to people on the east coast and uh i got a, an email from our exploration geologist just last night saying right what's the plan now what are we doing here when are we going to be here 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 and what's the focus so you know we uh we don't let off the gas that's for sure Fantastic, Alex. Well, look, thanks for running through all of that. And it sounds like a really exciting story and it's going to definitely be a stock to watch over the over the coming um, year and, and, and well beyond that. So it's been a pleasure talking to you this morning. Appreciate you making yourself available and uh, look, good luck with it. Um, as Alex mentioned, the, the AGM is shortly. Um, you're off to London to 121 next week and, and you'll be sort of uh, meeting with investors around Australia later in the month as well. So uh, plenty of opportunity to catch up on the critical story. Yeah, excellent. No, I appreciate it, Nick. And um, yeah, it's, uh, as you said, uh, lots ahead of us. And um, yeah, we're just getting started. Thanks very much. And look, thank you to everyone for tuning in this morning. Thank you for some great questions. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, that wraps up this morning's webinar. There will be a recording uh, that will be mailed out and posted on YouTube and all of the company's socials and website. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and have a great weekend. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.